Hey everybody, good morning. Thank you so much for joining me on this edition of Down to Earth. It's Down to Earth, right? And today is Tuesday. And I know by now most of us have kind of gotten over the shock of watching Kobe's memorial yesterday. I, for one, did not watch it. I couldn't go there. I'm sorry. I could not go there, and I still can't. It was too poignant and too powerfully poignant and too powerfully sad and moving that I cannot watch it. It's going to take some time for me to watch it in its entirety. And I think perhaps it's because he was so young and still so full of life. And he didn't take his life intentionally. So it wasn't drugs or alcohol or someone, you know, these things are more poignant when someone commits suicide and even more so when it's an unfortunate thing like an accident. And he was so young. He had just started the second chapter of his life and had four beautiful young children, had so much to live for. And we still want to think that he had so much more to give. And so I can't watch it. So I don't know about you. And it's even more sad because his daughter was with him. And imagine as a parent losing your child. I cannot begin to imagine that kind of grief. And I would not wish it on my worst enemy. So I couldn't watch it. I saw snippets of it uh, floating around on social media. I kind of stayed away from social media too, just to avoid it. But my children kept referencing it. And I was like, no, thank you. So today is Tuesday, and today is the 25th of February. Is it advancing, or is it just me? Is it me, or is it just advancing? I mean, like crazy around here. But I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, like, I am trying to understand what's this mad rush, like this mad rush. 2020 just started. I saw someone post something on 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 uh, Facebook, like name one positive thing that has happened to you since 2020, and nobody took her up on the offer. And I'm like, oh my god, it can't be that bad. I know everybody's probably waiting for their taxes. That's a positive thing. People are anxiously waiting for that tax money to come back, so they can <laughs> they can feel like a big spender for a little bit, right? Yesterday we talked about poverty and the cure for poverty and we got so much feedback that it, it's almost like maybe I did something right. I felt like I did something right. So I want to say something to all of you, right? So after doing some more talking and reading some more about poverty, I think we're going to do a follow-up to it later on, right? We're going to have to do a follow-up to it because it touched a lot of lives because a lot of the, uh, uh, perceptions that we have about people in poverty, we're now finding that there are misconceptions. And a lot of what I used to think that you can pull yourself up by the bootstraps, you can pull yourself together. And then I discovered as I got older and as I became an adult, maybe that was good when I was 19, 20, 21, you could think invincibly. But as I got older, I realized that life does suck sometimes. And life will send you and shock you with some stuff, yeah? And then you're left there like, oh, 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 I'm on life support, literally. And for so many of us, we have had to live through some very traumatic situations. And I just want to tell somebody out there today, I don't know what you're going through or whatever is happening with you. I just want to encourage you. And I just want to tell you that if you are like the rest of us, I just want you to know you are loved and you are cared for by me. Because I am telling you some of the stuff that we've had to live through, the layers of trauma that we've had to go through, the stuff that life has lent us and shoved at us into our faces that we never saw coming, and we had to deal with it, that I'm telling you just being here is enough of a survivor. It's a miracle to me sometimes that none of we, we haven't gone postal, I kid you not, with the stuff that has happened. And I, and I tell you, it, some of the stuff is so personal and so deep, you can't even talk about it. Some of the stuff, you just have to shake your head and just keep it moving. Even as I'm talking about it, I'm thinking about all the stuff that kept, that I could have gone crazy over, the stuff that I could have gone postal, the stuff that, and you recognize that you have to live through this and you have to ask yourself, why? 
did I have to experience this? Did I have to go through this? Do I have to know what this feels like? And you are here nonetheless. That's why I tell you, when you find yourself on the other side of the storm, like I have found myself on the other side of some of life's worst storms, I tell you, I live like there's no tomorrow. I make sure every day I get up, I eat right, I drink water, I exercise, I work out, I do what's right for me, I do what's good for me. I celebrate what I want. If I feel like going to the store, I feel like going to the store. If I don't, well, tomorrow's another day. I'm like, I life insurance, whatever. I, I, I kid you not. You get to the stage where you say, you know something? I have lived for everyone else. It's time that I live for myself. It's time that I start thinking about what's good for me. And I just want to encourage you that if that describes you, it's okay. It truly is because you're looking at someone who has had to survive some of the worst things that you can imagine. Some of the stuff, I don't even want to remember it. Last night we were sitting on the couch in the living room talking about my daughter's upcoming high school graduation. And it occurred to me that I, so much trauma has happened around me with some people I'm related to that I found that I didn't want to invite anybody. I was like, no. And my daughter said, I'd like so-and-so to come. And I said, hold up. Let me tell you why that is not a good idea for me. And please respect it. And I said it. I said, I just can't go there. I said, some of them have learned how to learn to live with it. I said, the stuff that they made me go through that was so unnecessary. I said, I don't want to see them. If I can avoid it, please help me to avoid it. I kid you not. <laughs> I kid you not, right? And if that is how you find yourself, then I am telling you, you're a survivor and a champion and this too shall pass. You will get past this. Just hang on in there. Don't take your life. Don't jump off a bridge. Don't go postal. Don't go yelling. Don't go screaming. Don't slash anybody's tires. Don't smash their windscreen. Do me a favor. Take a deep breath. It ain't even worth it. It ain't even worth it. There's always life after the storm, right? And to show you how much life there is. So, you know, yesterday when I, uh, my daughter's car could, wouldn't start because she didn't start it for a whole week. So, you know how they wait on mommy to do everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They wait on mommy to do everything. Right. So mommy didn't start her car. So she didn't start her car. So I'm like, okay. So then her car couldn't start yesterday. Oh, so now you want your car to go to, to school. Oh, okay. Car won't start. So I had to drop her. So we were in the car and sometimes I think these things happen, right? And we were talking <laughs> about, uh, you know, what's going to happen and stuff. So when we got home, she said, so mom, for Mother's Day, my eyes lit up. And I'm like, yes. And she said, for Mother's Day at 7 p.m. in the evening, let me just tell you now, I will be spending the day with you. So I said, mm-hmm, because by now I realize this is going somewhere. So, but at 7 p.m., there is a concert downtown that I'm going to. So I said, oh, okay. I said, that sounds lovely. I said, who's performing? So she said, little baby and what? NBA young boy. And I'm like, who is that? And she said, well, these are rappers and, you know, they're performing. And I said, oh, you play their music in the car? So she said, yes, I said, okay. So I said, well, it's going to be a hot girl summer. So this is Mother's Day. I guess hot girl summer is starting in May. So she's like, I didn't say we were getting tickets for both of us. I said, it's me and my friends who are going. And I said, but it's Mother's Day. It's the first Mother's Day that I would spend without you. And so, you know, I started guilt tripping her, right? I thought the guilt trip would work. She was firm. She's like, no. I said, but... I'm a hot girl. I said, I, I can, you know, I said, okay, here's what we do. When we get there, pretend that you're not with me. You go with your friends and I want, but I want a close up with little baby and young boy. <laughs> oh my gosh. I was doing it to freak her out. She was so freaked out. And she was like, wait, you're serious. And I'm like, I am serious. I said, what's wrong with going to a concert with a young rapper? I said, don't you play the music and I'm always bumping to the music. What's wrong with that? And she looked at me like, and I said, oh, I get it. You don't like when mommy's a hot girl, do you? Because when mommy's a hot girl, it's threatening. You think you will lose your mommy? I said, mommy isn't going anywhere. Mommy just wants to go to this concert. <laughs> the end result was, she's like, mom, you ain't going. So pray for me. We're still in negotiations about the concert on Mother's Day. 
uh, uh, we're still in negotiation because you know I'm trying to guilt her. I'm like, well, it's only a couple months after that you're leaving for college, and she's like, college is like 80 miles away. It's just right there. You'll drive up there if you want to. I said, no, I don't want to do that. So pray for me as I try to convince my youngest daughter that spending Mother's Day at a little baby concert with some dude named Young Boy, NBA Young Boy. The NBA means never broke again. Hot girl summer is on deck. So you will have a hot boy summer and you will have a hot girl summer. And I'm encouraging you all live your best life. Right? None of us know what the hour nor the time. And we are not going to live in anticipation of that. You live your life right now, regardless of what you have had to survive. Like me, don't let it show on you. Smile when it's over, when you have pulled yourself together. Because there comes a point when nobody is going to do it for you. The therapy, I had to go through therapy for some of the stuff that I went through. I really should have stayed in therapy for the rest of my life. But there came a point when I had to say, this is the decision I'm going to make about this situation. And I'm going to rest it because I have to live. There are some things that people do to you that, trust me, it makes no sense to rehash it. Because rehashing it only hurts you. I don't know why I'm going on about this. I don't know who this is for. This is for somebody. Don't rehash it. Probably segues into what we're going to talk about this morning. But don't rehash some of the stuff you've gone through. Once you have dealt with the pain of it, once you find yourself living through the pain, because sometimes it takes a while, once you find yourself doing that, just do yourself a favor and let it go gradually. It doesn't have to be right now. And I know letting it go is asking a lot because sometimes the people who do stuff to us, they deserve whatever is coming to them. Trust me. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. That's God's problem. Let God do the vengeance. That Let God handle that. As for me, you're not coming near me. You're not going to see me. You're not going to talk to me. I don't want to see you. I don't want to know you exist. If that is how the space in which you handle some of the stuff, then that's fine. I'm just telling you right now, from, take it from a survivor of some of the stuff that people pulled and you just need to live in your own space. This is why I am so liberated as an individual. I don't care what anyone thinks about me. I have come to understand life, right? That when it's over, you're a piece of meat on a slab, they cut you in pieces. Then they put your body parts in a plastic bag and shove it into your cavity and zoom, 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 and stitch you up and put you in a box and you're done. Since that is the expected end of everybody, right? All human beings. Then while I'm here living in this frame right here, oh, I'm gonna have a hot girl summer. You should have a hot body summer, right? And I'm gonna go back to the days when I could wear shorts, a booty shorts. Oh, yes, I'm going to have a hot girl summer. I live my life the way I want because I have determined that being free in my mind, being free of stuff is the best way to survive some of the stuff. People who have hurt you do not deserve your attention. They do not deserve one minute of your time. Your time ought to be spent surviving, encouraging you and building you up so that you are so strong in your mind, that you never have to go through stuff like that again. Amen. 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 I just wanted to say that. And, and it kind of segues into what I'm going to talk about this morning, internalized misogyny among women in the workplace. Because some of the stuff that people do to people, they do it as if nobody, like you're not a person, like you don't have feelings. Some of the stuff that people do to people, it's like, am I not a human being? When I was standing in front of you, did I look like a dog, a cat, a beer, a leopard, a, a, a tiger, a lion? Or did I look like a human being who has a thought and a soul? Did I have words coming out of my mouth? Did I have eyes? Did I have ears to hear? When you were so busy inflicting your internalized hatred and projecting it onto someone, did you realize how much you were hurting me? This is why sometimes when people apologize, I don't wait for their apology to validate myself. Do you see what I'm saying? Because their apology comes late. 
and their apology does not mitigate nor does it minimize the stress and the trauma and the pain that you have gone through. It doesn't lift it up. It doesn't do anything to it. So your apology, you can keep that and go sit on it somewhere because it doesn't help. Do you see what I'm saying? Because when you think about it, what does your apology really do? Is it important to me that you have accepted what you have done? No, it's not. You have already done it. You have already committed. As far as I'm concerned, you were conscious. You were walking and in your right mind when you did it. You knew exactly what you were doing. Don't come try to make nice about it. It's important for us to get there because we're talking about this. And as I talk about it, I'm recognizing when the subject, my producer brought this to me last night, I didn't want to go there. I was like, that's a subject I'm intimately familiar with, internalized misogy misogyny among women. I'm like, I can write the poster child about it. I can write about women all day long and how women treat other women, how good looking, how women who are not good looking treat women who are good looking, how pretty girls get picked on, how pretty girls get bullied. You think it's only ugly girls who get bullied? Ugly girls bully pretty girls. How women who are skinny bully fat women. How fat women hate skinny girls. I can write a book about this. So they hate you for your complexion. They hate you for your education. They hate you for your social standing. They hate that you're married. They hate you're not married. They hate that you have a better job. They hate that you have a man. They hate you have a better man. They find things to hate on you about. Every woman has had some situation where she has experienced misogyny. And it's especially painful in the workplace. You encounter it in other social groups. We also call it bullying. A woman, if you ever joined a sorority, you know, some, I, I, I'm college dropout. There are some things I'm not good with groups. I just am not. From I was a kid, they used to pick on me. So I learned real well to rely on myself. I learned real early. So I didn't need to be part of a group to be validated. So as I matriculated and grew later on, and women have these so groups and within their groups, they have social order. Who is at the top of the group? You're messing with the wrong girl because what you find afterwards, I'm not impressed. It, do it just doesn't faze me because I've learned to survive for most of my life by myself, staying in my own lane and just doing what I have to do and affirming myself based on who I am and what I have done with what I have. Do you see what I'm saying? And a lot of women who are in the workplace, you, you, I'm going to role play a scenario. A young girl just graduates college. Yeah, she goes to work. There is another woman there who has been in the same workplace for some time. She probably is even in the same field that the young girl just graduated college from. Right? So this young woman is looking for mentoring. Somebody who has been there, matriculated through the corporate ranks, worked through the system to tell her to help her along. What you find is that that doesn't happen. You want to know who is the misogynist in the workplace? The one who says, well, you have all heard of these kinds of women. Well, she's pregnant again. Or she has children. She has to go home. I'm not that woman. Why do you have to wear her? Why does she wear her skirt so short? Why does she wear her hair long? We don't want long hair around here. It's not professional. Hello, because my long hair feminizes me and makes me look softer and more attractive. You hate the fact that I have long hair because you cut yours off and put so much chemicals in them over time. You don't have any. I kid you not. They pick on young women. And you have those who say, well, I've been here longer. I'm like, your over is dried up. You've been there so long. Your over is dried up. You think a younger girl with over is coming in, the, 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 the partners and the, the men in the organization are going to flew, flew after her. So you start placing obstacles in her way. In her way. Happens all the time. It happens in social clubs. You join a country club and you are the new girl in the neighborhood and they start coming over and picking you apart. That ever happened to anybody? As for me, <laughs> I don't give a flying fig if you don't think that the number on the back of my china matches the number on yours. I don't give a flying fig. I remember I moved into a community one time and they came over and they were all wearing long skirts and, and, and flat shoes. You know, those unstructured skirts. They were made up, but they, they, they all looked matronly. And there I was, this young girl. I'm like, I turned to my ex-husband and I'm like, that's how I'm supposed to look? 
Are you kidding me? I'm like, that's not for me. I wear capris all day <laughs> and tank tops all day. And I lived in Florida. I'm like, I'm not wearing no long skirts. It's hot. I said, furthermore, you know, snakes and, and gators around, you know, you, you, you got to be careful, right? <laughs> it wasn't me. Have you ever joined a social group? The biggest one a lot of women find themselves in is you go to church. And they're like, this is how, I remember once I joined a church, you, you've heard me talk about this. And they're like, this is how, they called me one morning and told me I have to wear their minister's garb. The shirt, when I went to buy the shirt, at that time I was like a size two, right? I was really small. I couldn't find a shirt that could fit me. So they told me to buy a large. So I had to buy the next size of the, the medium was like big. And when I put it on, I'm like, I'm not wearing that. I said, why should I not look like myself? And I said, when I go in the stores, I shop at Macy's and TJ Maxx and Marshall's. When I go in the stores, I don't see any long skirts down to my ankles. And I said, what does that have to do with the condition of my heart and my soul? So I said, I'm not. So I called the pastor. I said, I'm, I'm not sitting up front today because I'm not wearing any long skirts. He laughed. He knew exactly what game they were playing. That is misogyny. They want, they want to bully you into playing a role that you are not supposed to play. It's internalized misogyny. It's internalized self-hatred. When other women hate themselves, they hate what they have become, so much so they project it onto others. They dislike something about themselves. They are also jealous of who they are. Let me read you something here. So I put this into perspective. It says, despite studies showing that men engage in indirect aggression, like gossiping and social exclusion at similar or even higher rates than women, it is wide, widely believed, because men do that too. It is widely believed that women are meaner to one another. You ever seen the movie Mean Girls? It's a real thing. I, I'm surprised no guys are calling it because you're all listening to this. That's why. You're out there. I know you're but you are like, let me let Harriet deal with this, right? Uh, women are mean to one another. Such beliefs are so pervasive that even preschoolers think that girls are more likely than boys to engage in relational aggression, such as excluding others, despite the evidence to the contrary. It's here is one of the reasons women with low levels of gender identification who think, listen to this, who think that their gender should be irrelevant at work and for whom connecting with other women is not important. Being on the receiving end of gender bias forces the realization that others see them first and foremost as women. I am sorry, but I'm a woman. I look like a woman. I'm going to be judged based on the appearance and based on my gender, the fact that I am a woman. I can't help that. I have come to accept societal misogynistic behaviors, biases, and prejudices as it relates to my color, my ethnicity, my mode of speaking, my social status. I have just come to accept that it is what it is. But what I struggled with for a long time was accepting that women who has walked in the same shoes I have walked in did not see me as a woman. They judged me based on appearance. They judged me based on social status. They performed the same types of microaggressions that men do. They exclude you from certain groups. They exclude you from direct communication or information impartation that could improve you. And have the nerve after that to act like a mean girl, like you're all in high school. This is why you see me around Metro Detroit. You see me in part of these groups. I don't have time for the foolishness. I don't have time for the mean girls because they're still in a high school cafeteria. Right? Uh, I haven't been to Texas in years. Right? I haven't been to, the last time I was in Texas, I was in Dallas. I haven't been to Texas. It's been a while. Right? Right? But I look forward to coming. If you're inviting me to come speak, I'd be happy to, right? But think about it, right? Just think about it. The kinds of stuff that women permeate on other women. 
help me to understand how does this advance us? We're in the same boat. We're all going in the same direction. We have way more societal impacts to deal with. There are many other women. Why are we being mean to one another? Men engage in, in, in forms of social aggression. But here's the thing. At the end of it, a man is going to use his brotherhood. Yeah? A man is still going to embrace another man irrespective of color and so on when it comes to certain things. Women don't do that. Women continually are mean. They will even tell you some social groups, you can't wear your nails higher than, than a half moon above your fingertip. You can only shop. In certain communities, you can only shop at certain places. In some workspaces that you work at, your children have to go to certain schools. You can only go to certain yoga uh, studios and so on. It's women perpetuating this myth. You can only wear clothing that looks like this. It's almost like a uniform. You can only uh, wear, drive these kinds of cars. You can only shop at these kinds of spaces. Women being mean to one another. And if you're not a size two or a size zero, then God help you with, with a size double D uh, uh, breast augmentation because they're not natural. They all go get, they all go to the same breast surgeon. Their faces look the same because they use the same fillers from the same face surgeon. And that is what you must conform to. I am not a conformist. I have, when I would, and I learned this early, just like the study says it happens from people who are in preschool. I learned this really early. They used to pick on me as a kid, right? And because they used to pick on me as a kid, I learned to sit by my lot. So I would read a lot <laughs> because it was entertaining. <laughs> It was knowledge improving and empowering. So as I grew older, I found that the mean girl attitude stayed the same. When I was in high school, they used to line up and watch me walk. And I know people wonder why, you know, they try to invite you to events and so on. And I'm like, why am I not really keen on going? And I'm like, because the last time I was there, <laughs> it goes back to the last time I was there. And people are like, you should move past that and forget about it. I'm like, I'm one of those persons who, you fooled me once, you got me. You're not catching me twice. You ain't catching me again. I'm not going to put you in the same mode for you to pull something similar like you did the last time. See, by the time I get to that stage, I've given you enough chances, but you didn't know that. Right? So I'm, you, because when I was in high school, they used to line up to watch me walk because they said I walked like a model. So I was walking and swing and they snickered and made fun of me because I didn't look like them. My mother didn't perm my hair because she thought it was too early to start perming my hair and imposing chemicals was too early. I'd have a lifetime of doing that. They made fun of my, the way I wore my hair. They made fun of the color of my skin. They made fun of my physical attributes that I had nothing to do with. I learned really early. So I never joined their social groups or their social clubs. I was always on the periphery. They came to me because I had information and I, that's just how I grew. You see what I'm saying? That was internalized misogyny. One girl was so bad that uh, she apologized to me years later on Facebook when Facebook made us connect with everybody, right? She apologized. But what she said to me as a child was very damaging. And these are some of the things that women don't even realize that they do to other women. People will leave a whole profession just because of something that a woman says to another woman. A woman in authority who should be mentoring, she's jealous. She sees this younger woman coming in and she assumes the younger woman is going to get more attention because that's always what it comes down to. Because we women somehow have been socialized to believe that male attention is everything, right? And so she thinks she's socialized to believe that. So another woman coming in is stealing her thunder. So they don't look out. They don't mentor or they're very damaging. They deliver criticisms that is, is damaging. Cloaked in, I'm mentoring you. No, you are tearing someone down. If you can't empower anybody, don't bother. 
if I'm not going to say anything empowering to you, if I'm not going to say anything that is going to make you pause and look at, I have a young girl who, who I, I, I mentor. Well, I'm her unofficial mentor. She chose me. I didn't, I didn't choose her. Right. And somebody, she posted something on her Instagram page and she, she's going through some processes and she has told me about them. But the people whom she said were making comments about what she was going through, they thought they were helping her. So I remarked publicly that they were not helping, that they were in fact contributing to her trauma. When she does emerge from this, she's going to remember these unkind comments from people whom she cared about, who should have been carrying her, but who drop you in the midst of it. And when I called her to show you how she didn't know she, she what agreed with what they said, the Stockholm syndrome kicked in. At the end of the conversation, she said, I am going to accept what you say because you're the expert on this and I trust what you say. And I said, I'm gonna pray for you and pray you through this, but be guided by these. Do you see what I'm saying? What they said to her was damaging. I have seen where women in the workplace have hurt other women. And I know there are some women who are hearing this and we need to stop and take stock of ourselves. When I was a young woman in ministry, I was a recently divorced single mother. I had just become a single mother. I had two children. What you may not have known about me at the time was that I had been uprooted socially and culturally from a background that I was familiar with and brought into a background that I had no tools to survive. I was struggling socially if you had taken the time to look. You would have seen that I was clinging on by a thin thread. But instead, they judged me. I was becoming a leader in ministry because I felt that hanging on to my faith, hanging on to any kind of faith, was going to help me go through what I had to survive. This is what I'm talking about when I say people impose things on you that are so hurtful that it takes time and a lot of time for you to be able to deal with them because of what they did to you that was uncalled for. And these women were so mean. Instead of looking at me as a young woman, with a, as a mother, raising two children by myself, right? Instead of looking at me as a young woman, I had a career, I had children to raise live trying to live according to the tenets of the faith that we found ourselves in they made fun of me they excluded me from gatherings they told me i wasn't welcome imagine that those same pieces you know what those same people today that's how you know grace is real because i can look at them today and smile because if what they if they had succeeded uh, what they tried to do, it's two things would have happened. I would have either killed myself or I would have gone crazy. You know what I determined to do? You ain't going to get the victory over me. You're not going to see your wicked acts perform what you wanted it to perform and achieve on me. You're going to have to live while I wear my crown every day. That's the message you all need to take away from this. You can't overcome it. You can't help the stuff that people will do to you. People are always going to treat you as bad as they wish and as bad as they want to based on themselves. A lot of people who are haters and a lot of people who hate people are people who have serious personality issues. They have serious mental disorders and we're so caught up in the minute trying to survive it. We don't even see it for what it is. I have a female relative who has hated me and it took my mother's death for me to realize that all these years, that's what it was. It was so close. I couldn't see it. It was so confounding. I couldn't understand it. It took time and distance for me to see for what it is that she hated me because she hated herself and that everything she had been doing through the years, she was trying to, she hated me so much. She wanted to become like me and become me the person, walk in my skin, be me, and become me so much so she hated herself. And then whenever I showed up, she projected her hatred onto me. If I said the sky's blue, she said it's green. 
I began to realize it took time and distance for me to see what it is. I let her go. I can't handle it. I don't want, I don't want to have anything to do with that situation. But at the time that she was doing it, as far as I'm concerned, she was conscious. She knew that she was hurting. And to me, she enjoyed seeing the hurt. Some of these folks who are doing this, they're doing it for, because they feel powerful. They're sociopaths and they're psychopathic because what they're doing is they enjoy seeing you hurt. They enjoy seeing the humiliation and the pain that you go through. It's kind of like they think they're tearing you down because they have the power to do it. This is called hatred. We are calling it misogyny, but it's called hatred. You hate another woman because she's pretty. You hate another woman because she's smarter. You hate another woman because your boss likes something about her. You hate another woman because she's married. You hate another woman because she's married to someone more successful, more handsome. You hate another woman because she has children and you can't have children. You hate another woman because she has a man you want. You hate her because she has favor with others. She's liked by other people. You hate her just because. It's called hatred. It's not misogyny. Misogyny is a nicely packaged term we have coined to apply to it when in fact it is what it is. Whether this takes place in a workplace, whether it takes place in a social club or in a social group, I have stories that I can tell you from here to Zion of how women have treated me. And, and this is the thing. They want you to say, uh, we're, they want you to forget about it. But if I forget about it. I'm not helping you. I'm not going, to, I'm not helping you by not pointing out the damage that you have done. You've done it to me. You probably are still doing it to others. And it, I want you to stop because it's damaging. And I know they listen to me. I'm going to tell you about a publicist here in the Detroit area, right? I see, I was new to town in 2009. I had just been here six years. These people have lived here all their lives. I didn't think about that. I just thought about fulfilling what I thought I was called to do. So I published my second book and I went to the pastor of the church and told him to write the foreword to my book. I had no idea that I was stepping on people's toes and that I was stepping on people's entrenched uh, territorial controls. I didn't know that was something I shouldn't have done. That was something I felt I should do. I did it anyhow. And I did not know the extent to which this was damaging both to the pastor's wife and to the women around her. I, I, I didn't think about it. So I was in, so this is my second book in this church. All of a sudden now I'm on radio and I'm to publish my second book. And one of the women in the church appoints herself as the leader of the authors in the church. All of a sudden they were here all along for over 30 years. And they didn't have a group of authors. All of a sudden, everybody realized they're an author. So she organizes a group and invite me to the group. I should never have gone. You know, everything in me was telling me not to go. But I said, no, Harriet, you, you, you have to go show your face. Worst thing I ever did. The publicist, her name is Pam Perry. Yeah. She apparently is their appointed publicist. She tore my second book apart, Musings of the Spirit. She tore the cover apart. She said it was low, it was didn't look good. It's the worst cover of a book she has ever seen. She took a microphone in a room filled with about 100 people, y'all. She tore me down. By this time, this is my second book. I'm on radio. And I, apart from that, I had my own career. I really didn't need her validation. She was just the publicist for these other folk. She tore my book apart. The night before, I had a dream about her. I had never met her before. So in my dream, I dreamt that she did it. But then years later, she came and apologized. Lo and behold, I'm at this event and realized that that is the woman I saw in my dream last night. I'm like, oh, my God, please tell me she's not going to do it. But she did. She tore my book apart in front of everybody. Of all the people in the room, everybody else had a book. She never treated anybody else like that. She made sure everyone in the room understood and knew that she was tearing me apart. 
I kid you not. I was so humiliated, but I was hurt. This is a group of women whom I recognized and whom I thought were going to be supportive of other women because I supported them. And you know what was the best part? The woman who organized it just sat there and smiled. They thought, maybe they thought by doing that, I would have put my head under a cover and rolled away and disappeared. <laughs> they don't know that this is Tiger. You push my back up so far against the wall. You got to be careful because my comeback is always stronger than the first time. I never forgot that. I never forgot that. This was misogyny. This was women hating on women. There were a backstory to it, obviously, because then I found out afterwards that I was new to the community, but they all knew each other. They all were in the same group. They all went to the same high schools, went to the same colleges, grew up in the same neighborhoods. So they knew each other. I was the new kid on the block. So where this girl comes from coming in here acting like that's the attitude that most people take towards others, where she comes from, who does she think she is? And they hate on women for it and women, especially, and look at us as women. We still have a long way to go. We still are fighting for equal pay. There are still battles. The Me Too movement started because we were fighting against sexual harassment from power brokers, from powerful men, sexual assault, and being forced to do things you don't want to do just because you're a woman and you want to be successful in the same field because you think you have the talent. Those are the important battles we should be focused on. That's what I thought at the time, that we needed to focus on advancing the causes of women because we would help one another. No, they were still stuck on just being a mean girl. And if I can show her that I am socially superior, and if I can show her, and what I realized, it took me years to realize that what she really was objecting to was because I never came to her first. She would have shut me down in the first place because she had a connection to the pastor and the pastor's wife. There you go. That was the behind the door connection. I've never forgotten that. Do you see what I'm saying? An example, a poignant pointed example of women hating on women. We need to stop stuff like that. So today when another woman, I, I don't care who she is, comes to me and asks me to look at her work, what do you think I do? You think I tell her, oh, you shouldn't do this? I even reach out to people who don't even like me, people who don't, are st I can see the jealousy, but I view myself as having more information than they do. Here is a way to guide them, to help them. Because it's not going to, it's oil off my back. It's not going to hurt me. It's not going to take anything from me to guide someone along the right career path and along the right path, how to navigate some of the stuff that they might encounter. It's happened recently. Another young woman is wanting to start a movement. Yeah, she thinks she can do it. Okay, I can't stop her from thinking like that, right? But she was making some moves that were not congruent to the, the productivity and the success of her movement. So I called her up, I said, Maybe you shouldn't do that that way. I don't, you know, you don't have to listen to me, but maybe you should go do so-and-so. She didn't even know how to take it. She became defensive because she don't, people don't know how to receive it. But I still left it there. And then I realized, because I knew eventually she would realize, and she did. She changed after that. Good. You see what I'm saying? Because that's what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> And many of us as women, we find ourselves in positions where we look at someone else and we think they're coming in. I, I had the same problem when I was in human trafficking in this area. Some of these people think, uh, one woman actually said, I've been doing this for 17 years and never ended up on TV and there you are. And I said, maybe that's the attitude, why? Because you were doing this to get attention. Maybe that's why they never chose you. What was your intention? I said, my intention is to help people and let the public become aware of what is going on with human trafficking and why we need to fix it. You are focused on getting attention. I'm not in here for that. 
I'm here for getting the work done and helping as many people as possible. See, I have lived such a life. You can tell that my life is rich with stories of people who have done some horrible things, but it's also rich with stories of people who have helped me. There are also people who have helped me. These stories that I've just told you, they helped me. They helped me to identify and they helped me to identify why some people are the way they are. It guided me. And it made me convicted enough that I would not do that to someone else. I said, no, I will not hurt them. I asked my daughter, my daughter's, my oldest daughter says that, mom, you are always surrounded by young people. And I'm like, I'm questioning myself now. And she said, no, don't. She said, it's because young people think you're cool. Because you, you, you know, you, you're not stuck up. You're just like, you just tell us the truth and you just level with us and just deal with it. And you know what we are actually talking about without being condescending. And I had to stop and think about it. And I said, maybe because the same thing. See, all these experiences, though they're bad, they were bad when they happened. They actually turned out for my good because they strengthened me and they developed my character so much so that I know view myself as more about helping others so they don't fall in the same things won't happen to them. So I'm saying to you today that especially if you're a woman and if you're a guy, you guys see this all the time, don't you? Don't you just shake your, your head and walk away? Please don't. Stand up for a woman who is being hurt on by other women. When you see internalized misogyny among women in the workplace, stand up as the boss. Stand up as another man and set it right. When women gather and sit at tables and they start tearing down another woman, whether her skirt is short, it's not short, it's too long, her hair is brown, it should be blonde, her hair is black, it shouldn't be, her hair is too long, her hair is too short, she has on lashes she shouldn't wear, she shouldn't wear mascara. Whatever it is that they're tearing down another woman, woman for stand up and defend so many times in my story the men who were standing there just let it happen and there i was hurt because i'm human there i have a self image i'm a person too women hate other women yesterday my daughter came in the car and it was one of those days for her i'm like you're a bit salty it's a good thing i stopped and got you a sandwich and I said, what's wrong? I knew immediately. She couldn't even talk about it. One of her friends, they have friends in common, decided to go to the library without including her. And she felt some type of way because the other friend who went with her is someone whom she's always gone with. And she said, wow, nice. Going to the library without inviting me. And the friend said, well, you can come along. And I said, you know something? I always told you about that girl. I said, there's something about her. I've been warning about her for four years. And now is the time that you need to separate from her. She was so hurt. And she said, mom, this is so high school. And I said, yes, women never get over it. And I said, if you keep this girl in your circle, you're going to go through this over and over. And one day she's going to come at your husband. She's going to come at your job. She's going to come at everything you have because she's a mean girl who is full of hate. They're too, we're still mean. Some of you women, you act as mean girls and it's time to stop it. You're mean. Accept it. Own it. You see another woman, you're, a fir, you're, you're the pastor's wife in a congregation. You see another woman coming there. The first thing you and your girlfriend sit down and do is, is she a threat to my position as the pastor's wife? Another woman comes into the organization. The first thing you think of is she's coming to take over my job and take over my role. Another woman joins the social group and you have to evaluate, is she coming to take my job or my role? That's being mean girls. You haven't left high school yet. Grow up. The pie is big enough for all of us. Some of us just take a bigger slice of the pie based on who we are and who we are created to be. And I'm just saying to all of us today, it's time to stop this mess. It's very damaging. Just like my 17-year-old daughter yesterday was so hurt by the actions of her friends. I said, it's time to drop every one of them. Don't text them. Don't talk to them. Be done Leave them alone because they're going to do it again and again and again. And understand that this is how women are. They're, they're, they're going to grow up and be just the same. They're going to laugh at you when you show up. They used to gather in groups just like when I was a kid. They would gather in groups and snicker when you show up. 
See, I can't talk about you. I can only talk about me. That's why I'm putting myself in smack in the midst of the story, right? But they're going to laugh and they're going to snicker. And some of them even go as far as destroying your marriage, sleeping with your husband, Kate Middleton, Prince William's wife of England. Her best friend slept with her husband. That's a mean girl. That's internalized hatred. She hated the fact that Kate had something she couldn't have. The only thing she could do was destroy it by opening her legs to Kate's husband, thinking it was going to destroy Kate's marriage and would destroy Kate. That's mean girls. Y'all need to stop it. And women who are out there, you're in a position, mentor other women. Don't tear them down. Mentor them. Show them the right way. Say it nicely. Don't, you don't have to tear them down because you, why do you always think that you have to be unkind to someone so you can feel good about yourself? Mentor them, show them support, guide them. Here is a resource that I think here's one uh, popular politician around here. She'd never invite me anywhere. She never liked me from the beginning. <laughs> she has internalized self-hatred. Somebody suggested to me the other day, why don't you, I said, she, Girl, she's never going to invite me anyway. She's never going to be on the same platform with me. She thinks she's, I said, leave her. But she took on to, she took on to one of my protégés. You know what she saw? She couldn't, I, she, she and I, I would take the shine off her. You see how she's being a mean girl? She, she, as transparent as that. She knows who she is. Hasn't grown up yet. Hasn't left high school yet. But you want higher leadership? What are you going to do with a young woman? I asked her mother that years ago. I said, you need to talk to her. She wants to run for office. You need to talk to her. What is she going to do with the young women who come into come around her? She's going to hate on them because she thinks that they're prettier or she thinks that they are more attractive or they're more accomplished or they're more educated. And you're going to hate them for who they are and created to be. You have your own purpose. Live it. Do it. If you are so confident in what you have and what you do, nobody can take you away from being you. It's still you. Be you. Nobody can be Harriet Kamek. You might like my brand. You might like my lifestyle brand and like how it looks on me. But you can't be me because you haven't had the benefit of living like me. You see these young women, they're desperate for being mentored. Some of these young girls, they don't know how to navigate the pathways of life. Show them. Okay, honey, you can't go to an interview dressed like that. <laughs> when you are speaking to people whom you want a job from, this is what you should say. It's not, it's not going to, and you guys, you see this all the time and you're like, dang, women are mean to one another. And then your daughter comes home, your niece comes home, right? And says this to you and you're like, so when you see, I'm just going to ask you that, especially you guys, because they're really doing it to get your attention. You know that, right? They're really doing it to get the attention of men because women have been socialized to be validated by the approval of men. This is what this is all about, to be one of the guys, to be seen by the guys. Some women want to be one of the guys. Some want to be seen by the guys. Some women think that other women get more attention than they do, and it's not fair. So they're going to shut her down, especially you guys who have beautiful daughters. Your daughters are pretty or they're talented. Don't your daughters come home and say, I don't know why the coach hates me. I don't know why the teacher hates me. I don't know why that girl hates me. Doesn't your daughter complain about that? Doesn't your wife come home and talk about this? Don't you hear your sister talks about this? And you hear the pain in their voice and you're like, shh, da, 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 da. maybe you shouldn't do that. No, it's tell her what it is. It's internal hatred she's projecting. She hates you because she thinks. Just tell her what it is. I tell her, but you be great anyways. Keep doing what you're doing. The choice. They wouldn't help me, y'all. <laughs> I had to figure it out and do it. Right? So now I can teach others and show others. Right? Isn't it the stuff? The stuff. 
that we do to one another, the stuff, y'all, the stuff. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's just like after this, I'm gonna have, I'm either gonna go have a chai latte. I'm going to eat some chocolate. So <laughs> something has to give. Because <laughs> when I think about all this stuff, I, I, you know, I go to, by the time I go to bed at night, I don't think about this. I kind of rested. This is why I have an active prayer life. My children say I'm more a hippie than anything else. Because I wear my hair how I want to wear it because it's liberating for me. Right? I dress how I feel like dressing. I don't have gender norms and conformities about what women should dress like at certain parts of their journey. I don't know what, what I dress, how I want to dress yesterday. It was so warm here in Michigan. I had on capris. I had on boots though mm -hmm. to keep my feet warm, but I had on capris and a tank top on a hoodie. People were like, and I'm like, it's getting warmer, hot girl summer on day. So if you have females, whether she's your wife, your girlfriend, your partner, your lover, your ex, your sister, your daughters, your nieces, and you hear them start calling, talking about why this woman hates me. I don't know why she can't stand me, dad. This girl just does this to me. The teacher, the coach, the guidance counselor. No, you know why. Help. Because they're all doing it because they feel some sort of way. It's the craziest thing ever. Isn't the jealousy that green-eyed monster? Oh, breathe, oh, breathe, right? Thank you so much, everybody. I'm so honored that you chose to listen to me this morning. I ask you kindly to share this message with others. Yeah, it helps. Spread the message and go to my podcast on Spotify, as well as on Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and so on. And share this message with everybody else, right? Pray for me as I pray for you. I pray that this message gives you comfort and peace as you matriculate and go to my website, harrykamrick.com. If you want me to come speak somewhere and uh, if uh, at all possible, go to my page on Anchor FM, Down to Earth with Harriet Kamrick and become a supporter. We need that, right? Your support helps to keep us on the air because they track this stuff. So share this message with others. Thanks so much, everybody. Be blessed. Wow, <laughs> what a morning. Wow. <laughs> what Thank a you morning. Block talk radio. Bye, everybody. Bye. Huh.